well, there's, there's something happening now that, that really hasn't happened before, and, and it is very important and quite urgent that we recognize what's going on. Um, that is, that the ice has been getting thinner as over the last 40 years since I've been measuring it, uh, it, and it's now lost about half of its thickness. So the average thickness of ice in the Arctic now is about half what it was 30 years ago. That's a big change. And it, so far it hasn't shown itself in a collapse of the ice cover, but it will very soon because you can't keep thinning something off for a long time without it in the end collapsing. What's been happening is that the, this, the ice cover's been shrinking slowly, a few percent per decade, and um, so the whole Arctic Ocean is covered with ice in the winter. Then in the summer it shrinks back a little bit. And if you're lucky you can sail around the Northwest Passage or the Northern Sea Route, but just via some narrow slot. But then about five years ago the shrinkage started to accelerate. And now in the summer we have a huge area of open water in the middle of the Arctic, enough that you can see it on a satellite picture and the Earth looks blue at the top end instead of white. And that uh, shrinkage is because the thinning of the ice is causing it to break up more readily in the summer. Uh, and in fact, what's happening now is that the melt in the summer is greater than the growth in the winter. So all the ice that grows during the winter will melt the following summer. So you will have a summer Arctic, which is actually ice free. And this will come about very soon at the rate w we're going. If you uh, extrapolate what's going on now for thickness, it'll bring us to an ice-free summer Arctic in about four years' time. So already we should be seeing something drastic happening probably this summer. Well, the Arctic is warming faster than most places on the planet. And that's partly because of the sea ice. Because as we begin to lose some of the sea ice, it exposes the darker ocean, which absorbs more sunlight, and it causes the ocean to warm further and melt more ice there are potential irreversible effects of melting the sea ice. If it begins to allow the Arctic Ocean to warm up and warm uh, the ocean floor, then we'll begin to release methane hydrates. And if we let that happen, that's a potential tipping point that we don't want to pass. Well, it's in many places, but the frozen methane what we call clathrates or hydrates, which is a form of methane gas interlaced with water molecules in a certain sludgy form of ice. It's been formed by biological processes over many millions of years, and it's stored in the ocean sediment, the bottom, particularly of the shallow oceans, north of the European continent and the North American continent, so the Canadian uh, continental shelf and the Siberian continental shelf very rich deposits of methane held in the sedimental areas. But remember, those areas have been subject to ice ages, and we have fossil ice in the seabed left over from the ice ages, which has masked great deposits of methane underneath that frozen layer, as well as more recent methane in clathrate form above the fossil ice. So it's a big store, about three times, we think, the amount of hydrocarbons stored in the methane deposits, both in the shallow seas and also to some extent in the tundra on land, than the totality of oil, coal and gas deposits on the planet. Huge amount. So I would say that we started investigation the methane issue in the Arctic in 90s of the last century. And we started from the terrestrial ecosystem, freshwater ecosystem, and then um, about uh, eight years ago, switched to studying the East Siberian Arctic Shelf. And actually, we've been studying it for the last eight years, continuously, year by year by year, conducting one or two expeditions a year. And if, for example, a few years ago, we could reach the, um, the certain uh, sites from the fast ice. Fast ice is annual ice, and we can reach quite easily to certain sites, hundreds or tens of kilometers um, from the coast. 
But last two years we couldn't do that because the ice was broken. It was polynias, it was brines, it was leads. So that means that, and where the sea ice should be about two meters thick, it was 40 centimeters thick. That means that the processes, the, all the processes that serves, that serves destabilization of everything, of the sea ice, of the water column, of the, the currents increasing, the currents, I mean the movement of water beneath the sea ice increased. So everything, everything looks anomalous. Well, there are now observations that methane is beginning to be released by both melting tundra on the land and bubbling up in the Arctic Ocean, indicating some warming of the Arctic Ocean. But one of the big effects is already happening, and I think the most important effect is the fact that with the sea ice already retreating in the summer, this slot of open water has become a very large expanse and that open water absorbs so much radiation during the summer months that it warms up. So instead of sitting there at the freezing point like it used to do, it now warms up to about five degrees. And five degrees is very warm by Arctic standards. And that amount of heat in the water is enough to start warming up the seabed because we're, the retreat is happening over the continental shelves where the water's shallow. And so the seabed's warming up and the seabed at the moment is frozen. Uh, it contain, it's offshore permafrost, an extension of the permafrost on land out under the sea. But when you're warming that up to five degrees every summer, it's now starting to melt and the permafrost is disappearing. And what that's doing is allowing a lot of methane, which is trapped under the permafrost, to be released. Uh, it's trapped as methane hydrates at the moment, but as soon as you melt the permafrost, it turns back into methane and bubbles up. So for the last two or three years, the, there's been a, an, a, a joint Russian-Alaskan expedition going out into the Siberian Sea and observing this, and they've been seeing great plumes of methane uh, bubbling up all over the East Siberian Sea. The whole uh, zone of millions of square miles of territory uh, is now releasing all of its, its methane cover. And that's a, a large boost to global warming because methane is an extremely powerful uh, climatically active gas. It's about 23 times as powerful as carbon dioxide per molecule. I think the relationship between the behaviour of sea ice and the behaviour of the release of methane in the Arctic is very important. As temperature goes up and it has reached an increase of about three degrees already over the pre-industrial uh, temperature in the Arctic. It's, it's warming faster than any other place on the planet. Um, lots of things start happening together and it's the combination of these processes that is so important to grasp. Not only do you have less sea ice near to the coast, so the coastal waters are warming, but you have warming of the tundra, thawing of the tundra, the permafrost areas on the continental near coastal area. So the water running off from that comes in as warm fresh water. So that warms the, 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 the shallow seas over the, the continental shelf and pushes the sea ice further back. That means that that whole area of the ocean is now open to wave energy, storm energy, tidal energy, mixing down. So that the warm water from the surface is now being mixed down to those areas that it never reached while the whole area was, was covered in sea ice. So as soon as the area is open water, you have a process of heating that goes right down to those clathrate deposits on the seabed. They will then, instead of just releasing slowly and getting absorbed under the ice, start bubbling up through the surface of the water into the atmosphere. And the more the methane is released into the atmosphere, because it's a greenhouse gas, the more energy is retained from the solar input and the faster the heating goes, which increases the rate of ice movement, decreases the area of the snow fields, increases the heat of the runoff, 
increases the heating in the ocean, increases the rate of methane, which increases the warming, which increases the rate of methane. And you have this feedback process setting off. This particular sediment layer, which is 53 meters, doesn't seal this methane escaping from the seabed deposits any longer. It provides us with gas migration pathways. This is what is what is significance of this. I think we're all used to feedback systems in many processes of life. Um, I'm sure you've been in a public hall with a public address system running and somebody on the sound system has turned the amplifier up too much and the, the output from the, the loudspeakers goes into the microphone and you get into a howl and everybody goes, oh, let's turn that off. Well, that's where feedback gets into the system and increases the signal. Lots of things in the climate that we have on, on Earth do that. Now the distinction between just a feedback process and a runaway feedback process is very, very important indeed. You can have feedback that slowly increases, if you like, the risk and puts the temperature up a bit higher. Runaway feedback says the system responds so much to increased in temperature that it becomes faster in the way it changes the climate with rising temperature. So the hotter it gets, the faster it gets hotter. And the hotter it gets, the faster it gets hotter faster. Until you move into a process, this is completely uncontrollable. And instead of coming up to a new equilibrium temperature, maybe a bit high, it goes on going up faster and faster until something runs out. And there's no more methane to release or we've run out of forests to burn or something. Or there's no more ice to melt and so that there's no more reflection feedback going on. Um, the danger of moving into a runaway climate change scenario is now clear and is beginning to be quantified for the first time in the last few months. Um, it's probably the greatest threat that we face as a planet. So the, the methane in the atmosphere, the amount, the total amount of methane in the atmosphere, in the current atmosphere, it's about five gigatons. The amount of carbon of preserved um, in form of methane in this burn Arctic shelf is approximately from hundreds to thousands of gigatons. And of course, it's only 1% of that uh, amount is required to double the atmospheric burden of methane. But the, to destabilize 1% of this carbon pool, I think it's not much effort needed, considering that the state of permafrost and the amount of methane currently involved. Because the, what uh, divides this methane from the atmosphere is a very shallow water column and a weakening permafrost, which is losing its ability to seal, uh, to serve as a seal. Just because this area is uh, very seismically and tectonically active, and there was some investigation that the tectonic activity is increasing, and the seismic activity is, what is seismic activity? is destabilization of this grounds. It's just mechanical forcing destabilization. So it's additional pathways for this methane to be escaped. We do not like what we see there. Absolutely do not like. Um, the other thing, of course, is climatic instability, that with, with an open Arctic, uh, you're going to have many more events like just we've had in the last uh, few weeks of uh, outbreaks of, of uh, cold air in places you don't expect, um, l large instabilities in, in, the, in the atmosphere and which will affect agricultural production. So we, we think, you, you sort of think you're going to gain from global warming in that it gets warmer, you can grow more crops, you can grow crops further north uh, in Canada and Siberia and that's true but also the instability means that, that at, at critical times uh, those crops are going to be affected by, by frost or uh, f floods or rain. And um, the, the estimates are that actually 
you won't gain much from the warming in the northern hemisphere and you will lose a lot of course from the warming in in all the tropical regions which is really going to have a very serious effect on on agricultural production so there's the the global warming impact on on agriculture is is going to be very serious and it's going to be difficult to see how to support even the present world population maybe this is the job that uh that differs the previous warm epoch when permafrost also probably appeared and also experienced this degradation, destabilization. But the destabilization didn't reach that point. And in this, in the Galatian epoch, it reaches the point, or about to reach the point, maybe the turning point. I think that the concept of adapting to the climate change is really a dangerous one because there is the potential for climate effects which humanity practically cannot adapt to. If the ice sheets become unstable and sea level goes up multimeters and eventually tens of meters, well, you're going to put all of the cities on coasts all around the world underwater and you will destroy all of that heritage. So we don't want that to happen. That's the economic consequences of that are so enormous. It it makes no sense to talk about adaptation to that. And likewise, if we if we burn all the fossil fuels, then we certainly will cause the methane hydrates eventually to come out and cause several degrees more warming. And it's not clear that civilization could survive that extreme climate change. The rate of change that we're generating in the current situation is between two and three hundred times faster than that experienced in any of the extinction events apart from the asteroidal impact. If you look at the general background change, for instance, it takes about 10,000 years to change the concentration of carbon dioxide by about a hundred parts per million. We're doing it in 30 years at this year's rate. So the rate of change in the climate is phenomenal compared to previous extinction events. We are already in a mass extinction event. It isn't something that's going to happen in the future. We are now losing species and losing populations, partly by climate change, partly by habit habitat change, and partly by over-exploitation of habitats and fisheries, fisheries for instance. We've lost about 40% of the phytoplankton in the ocean, which is the base of the food chain, simply because of acidification and temperature change in the climate. This is already a mass extinction event. The question is, how far is it going to go? How serious does it become? And if we are not able to stop the rate of increase to, of, of temperature itself and to get that back under control, then a high temperature event, perhaps another five or six degrees, would obliterate at least as many as 60 to 70 to 80 percent of the populations and the species of the rest of life on Earth. Whatever you do as an individual in your personal life is, is tiny, although it, it adds up if everybody does it, but, but what you can do to, to say influence politicians is is m maybe more more important as a, so your role as a citizen concerned citizen is is the most important role I think a normal person can adopt.